Hello, I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Welcome to A Current Affair. Will the real Charlie Teo please stand up? Australia's most famous neurosurgeon is also the most polarising. If you watched 60 Minutes on Sunday, you might think he's a dangerous maverick who has no place in an operating theatre. But countless patients say he's their miracle lifesaver. I sat down with him today. Charlie Teo, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. You are probably Australia's best known neurosurgeon. You have performed thousands of surgeries. You have lots of happy patients and you've saved lives. And yet you are outlawed by the medical establishment in Australia. Whose fault is that? I mean, I'd like to say it's everyone else's fault except for mine, but I've got to take some blame for it. I mean, I don't do diplomacy well. I think I'm good, and so I'm not scared to say that. Uh, so I've got to take some blame for it, but it's not all my fault. I mean, I never wanted to be the, uh, uh, you know, the person who was the outsider or the maverick. Uh, in fact, I would love to have been, you know, mainstream. There's nothing you've ever said that makes me think you would have <laughs> loved to have been mainstream, Charlie Teo. Uh, mainstream in the way that uh, maybe I wouldn't have been so persecuted and I wouldn't have had to watch my back so much. So, yeah, I would like to have been under the radar in that way, but no, not under the radar in terms of pushing the envelope. That is that is absolutely me. So do you believe that you are in trouble purely because of your personality, not because of your practices? You know, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I have made mistakes. But in terms of making mistakes, in terms of the way I treat my patients, that's what I... I resent that claim, that I treat my patients poorly or that I've done the wrong thing by them. They've always been first and foremost in my uh, approach to medicine. This issue of who's to blame and, and who's contributed to this situation is, I think, critical here. And I think for people who are watching you tonight, you know, they either believe your critics that you're a, a cowboy who has a god complex or they believe you're a hero who pushes the margin of convention and they're trying to figure out who's the real Charlie Teo and that's what I want to do. I want to try and shed some light on that so maybe they can answer that for themselves. Can you understand that, that there are these two clear images of you? What I want to do is set the record straight and, and make sure people, you know, if they want to judge me, judge me on what I truly am, not what other people have told you I am. All right. Well, part of the purpose of today was to give you right of reply because 60 Minutes did a fairly um, comprehensive story on you on Sunday night, which wasn't that, flattering. That's not the descriptive I would have used, Tracy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go to it. Let's address some of those um, allegations and some of those stories in 60 Minutes. Let's talk about Michelle Smith, who says that you operated on the wrong side of her brain and failed to remove the tumour that caused her epilepsy. What do you say to that? It goes like this. Her tumour was in an area where the best approach was from the other side. So even though the tumour was on the right side, you operate on the left side because it gives you a better access. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we use frameless stereotactic guidance, which is a computerised guidance system, and that allows you to localise the tumour very well, and you cannot, it's impossible to operate on the wrong side of the brain. The third thing is, yes, I did leave tumour behind. I left tumour behind because when I got in there, the definition between normal and abnormal was very poorly defined. So I, I thought it did the right thing. Uh, and in all, on all accounts, it, did, it was the right thing. Uh, she, that seems not to be her story. She seems to say that she had an MRI 10 years later and during that time her seizures had continued and worsened. Uh, and when she had the MRI 10 years later, the new neurosurgeon said and showed some scans, they showed some scans showing with a green circle where you'd apparently operated before and a red circle showing where the tumour was, the original tumour was. Yes. How do you explain that? Because that's not just opposite sides of the head, that's opposite sides of the brain. What they disputed was the fact because I used a keyhole minimally invasive technique, there was no evidence that I was operating on the side of the tumour. OK, so why did you settle the case instead of fighting it? No, I wanted to fight it. No, you have no say in that. If the insurance company decide they want to settle it, they will settle it without your, uh, without your permission. Insurance companies hate paying if they think they don't have to pay, though. Look, I think it would have... Uh, I think it would have just gone on and on and on. So we settled without blame, uh, not, uh, not agreeing that we did anything wrong, uh, but uh, settled without fighting it. <clears throat> 
Let's move on to Mikolaj Barman. Yes. Now, he had a condition called DIPG, which is a brain stem glioma that's diffused, which means it's sent out tentacles. So it's not a contained tumour. DIPG is inoperable, are you saying that? Do you say that categorically? Categorically, yes. All right. Mikolaj was a four-year-old boy in India who was diagnosed by two Indian neurosurgeons as having DIPG. Yes. You told the family that there was a high likelihood of cure. Why did you do that? I would never have said there's a li high likelihood of cure. It's, it's, it seemed to be there in an email from you, high likelihood of cure, and there seemed also to be his father sent you messages, yes. email messages, questions, and you said that if all goes according to plan, surgery should be curative and he should live a, a long and happy life. Okay, so a diffuse tumour is truly inoperable. No one's going to op operate on a diffuse tumour. The problem is that the diagnosis of diffuse tumour has been overdone by many people, many people. So the bottom line is that there is poor definition for the diagnosis of these inoperable diffuse tumours. And as such, a lot of focal, operable, curable brainstem tumours are lumped into that category of diffuse inoperable. How often does that happen? If you look at the literature, 10% in one article, 40% in another article. That means 40% of children with a focal tumour are diagnosed as diffuse and are sent to their death. Okay. Other people then say, okay, you're right. Uh, radiological criteria is poor. You should just biopsy them. So the biopsy thing is trying to find this molecular marker called H3K27M. Okay. There was a time where we all thought that if it came back, if you did a biopsy and it was H3K27M positive, then it was a diffuse tumour, you shouldn't operate, done your biopsy, send them off for radiotherapy. If you look at the literature now, it actually says, well, we got it wrong. His father said that about half an hour before the surgery, you told him the tumour was diffused. Why did you go ahead with the surgery given that it it was a diffused brainstem glioma. Okay, so this becomes even more complicated. No one has ever defined a third group. It's always been focal or diffuse, black and white. I believe there's a third category of diffuse and focal, a mixed glioma with a focal component and a diffuse component. I am trying to now define if it's worthwhile operating on these patients. It does seem to be worthwhile. Now, the danger in that operation is that you've got to stop at the focal component and don't go into the diffuse component. With micolage, I didn't get it right. And, you know, that is, unfortunately, the nature of brainstem surgery. It only takes one millimetre too far and you can damage someone irreparably. I mean, micolage spent the last eight to ten months of his life. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he couldn't eat. He was staring at the ceiling and he communicated by blinking his eyes. Yeah. Is that worth giving it a shot? Is that better than death? Oh, Tracy, I mean, that's such a philosophical question. You're absolutely right. Some people would say, no, it's worse than death. But that's what you grapple with with families, isn't it? Yeah. That's what you have to grapple with in, in informed consent, isn't it? For some outsider who's not sitting in that room with you, having that discussion with the patient, it, it's so wrong for them to judge you on what's going on in that room. It's... It's body language, it's social situations, and if you're not honest with them or if you're too subjective and, and uh, projecting your thoughts onto them, then that's when you can come a gutzer. That's bad. And when I was young, I did that. Quality of life is so different for everyone. OK, so when you said to Mikolaj's family, there's, you know, uh, surgery should be curative and there's a high likelihood of cure... No, I, look, Tracy, I would never have said that. Not a high likelihood of cure. Surgery should be curative if all goes according to plan. Yeah, surgery That's could... the part they hear. Yeah, Did I'm... you make a false promise with 2020 hindsight? No, absolutely not. Okay. I, look, I know I didn't because my whole... They think you did. I know. Well, again, if you could just walk a mile in my shoes. They think I did because... Like, I'm not trying to say this to be derogatory to them but people when they make a decision and the outcome is bad they usually like to blame someone else 
When I get a bad outcome, I don't want you to think it doesn't affect me. It affects me terribly. I mean, I'm sometimes sobbing downstairs alone. OK, let's talk about Bella Howard, because Bella Howard is a, a, was a little Australian girl. Yeah. Also diagnosed with DIPG, same type of tumour. You, in a medical report, said you agreed it looked like DIPG, but her family says you gave them a 1% chance that that could be wrong. They didn't hear the 99% chance that that could be right. They went with the 1% chance that that could be wrong. Should you have given them a 1% chance if it, was, if it looked like DIPG and you thought it probably was DIPG? So, yes, the radiology report said it was DIPG. Yes, the previous surgeon said it was DIPG. Yes, if you showed it to 99 out of 100 neurosurgeons in the world, they would call it a DIPG. My feeling was that it wasn't. It was focal and it was worth giving it a shot. So should you not have operated on Bella and Michelage? Well, everything's easy to say in retrospect. Uh, with Bella, no, I think I still would operate today. With Michelage, yeah, I'd probably still operate today. I mean, and the reason I say that is because I've got all these other great results. Do you wish now that you had not operated? Are you sorry that you operated? Now that you know what you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, look, I'm not sorry that I operated. I'm sorry about the outcome. And the outcome was from me. You know, no one else can take the blame. That with Michelage, for example, sure, I took out the focal component, but I went one millimetre too far and I took out some of the diffuse component and damaged him. And that, the, the blame is totally on me. I've got to, I've got to accept that. All right, Joe and Kathy Leslie would say that you didn't, give them a full consultation and you didn't tell them exactly what you, you assured them that Joe's surgery would not leave him blind because that was his line in the sand I don't want to be blind all right and he was blind as a result of his surgery and I guess you knew what part of the brain you you were going to be operating in so how is that full disclosure and informed consent well if I had guaranteed them that there was no chance of blindness that is me saying the wrong thing that's misinformation I never, I, I just don't do that. You can't do that and not get sued. Someone's going to sue you one day. And after 11,000 cases, you don't think if I'd said that to a handful of patients, I'd be sued by those patients? In that case, I thought the chance of blindness was almost zero. But I never give a guarantee. So if, I, if they are claiming that I said that I guarantee he won't be blind, that is an absolute lie. I did not say that. I would never say that. You'd be foolish to say that. If you had a brain tumour and there was a chance that you would end up blind or paralysed or vegetative, bedridden for the rest of your life, would you roll that dice and take that chance? Here's a problem, Tracy. It's not you. It's wrong for doctors to project their idea of quality of life, of risk appetite, onto their patient. I, I remember Miklaj really well. He's a beautiful little boy. I mean, you don't understand what that does to me. This beautiful little boy comes and says to me, you know, I have faith in you. Hi, Dr. Charlie. He's, he's gorgeous. He's got so much spunk. And my operation ruined him. It took away that spunk. It took away that quality of life. I did that, Tracy. I've got to face that every day. And, and, and if someone's trying to portray me as some money-hungry bastard who, who is operating and hurting children based on, uh, uh, based on money, that's what I want to correct. It's not that case. So there's a French vascular surgeon who in 1951 wrote a, a book on the philosophy of surgery. And I don't think you can put in any better words what he said. He said, every surgeon carries within himself a small cemetery. Now, my cemetery is not small. It's a significant size cemetery. It's on my phone. I keep pictures of my patients on my phone to remind me every day of how I've got to do it better, how I've got to find an operation that's more perfect, how I've got to find a cure for cancer. That is my cemetery. So when someone says to me or accuses me of being of, of disregard for life, disregard for quality of life, treating my patients as if there's some sort of bank where I can get money out of them, that I find abhorrent and disgusting. And the whole disgusting thing about 60 Minutes was this, and that is by using those people to destroy me 
It was irresponsible and it was wrong on those patients. For Bella Howard to be used as a case against me means that the lessons I've learned from her operation, the wisdom that I've gained from her suffering, I'll never be able to use again. And, and for someone to come out and say, oh, uh, you know, we're going to portray you as this money-hungry guy who operates without regard for life uh, and we're going to stop you from operating, you know, that is a disservice and that is a... Uh, uh, that is a disservice and it's an insult to the Bella Howards of this world. OK, I've heard everything you've just said, except the Bella Howards and the Mikolaj Barmans of this world are not lab rats. They're not an experiment. They're lives. They're not a learning exercise or a training exercise. Yeah. No, and, and th that's so do that... you question your decision-making because of those results? Look... It's, of course, when you get a bad result, you're going to learn from it and you're going to hopefully not do it again. I interviewed Chris O'Brien and he didn't have a bad word to say about you. You bought him, I think, another couple of years of his life and he's probably still, you know, perhaps your, your most famous advocate. Also, you know, you looked after Gary Ralph, who we campaigned for during COVID to get out of quarantine, hotel quarantine, after yeah. his... Uh, glioblastoma surgery with you in, in New South Wales. He had to go back to Queensland. He was told he had one week to live on the day of the surgery. He got about another six weeks. And I spoke with Wendy Child, his wife, yesterday. She hasn't got a bad word to say about you. She thinks that six weeks was worth it. I acknowledge that there are many, many people who say that you're the hero who pushes the boundaries. Yes. Can you understand the other point of view though can you understand that i can understand the other point of view if the decision to operate was based on for the wrong reasons all right the other accusation and you've said that you're not in it for the money and you find that um, accusation reprehensible but you don't work in the public system and your patients very often have to crowdfund to pay for surgery that costs uh, 80 or 100 or 150 thousand dollars it's a lot of money if you're not in it for the money why not be in the public system? Oh, OK. So I'm going to say something, Tracy, that I might regret, but here we go. If your attitude is that you want to treat every patient like your own family member, then you want everything going for you. You want the nursing staff to be uh, trained uh, and on the ball. You want the anaesthetist to be the best. Uh, you want the tech... Uh, the, uh, instrument and equipment to be the best, that's what you want. Okay, so here's the problem with the public health system. I worked in the public health system for many, many years. They refused to give me my own team. They refused to give me neuro-dedicated nurses. So I was forced to operate with nurses who had never done neurosurgery before. One of them bumped my hand, it hurt the patient, and I swore after that I would never operate in a system that doesn't encourage excellence or doesn't encourage subspecialisation. But people are doing good surgery in public hospitals, notwithstanding everything you've just said. People are and getting good results, aren't they, surely? Yeah, and I've operated in the public system and I've had good results in the public system. One of the most difficult cases I did in the public system. If I was a patient, I'd want my surgeon to be relaxed. I'd want him to have confidence in the staff around him. And that happens in the private system with me. It never happened in the public. The money accusations uh, made on 60 Minutes centred around you wanting cash up front before surgery, look like that night before surgery right. happened the next day, right. $50,000 up front, that you were asking for $800 cash for the consultation. What do you say to that? I've been criticised for it and I accept the criticism. And that is that I've never uh, interested myself in the money side or the financial side of my business. Having said that, I will take responsibility for it. And the fact is that uh, patients were paying cash for a consultation. I don't know why that happened, but it, it was right from the very get-go. And it's probably because we didn't have a, uh, you know, the thing that you swipe your credit card on when we first opened the practice and patients were paying cash and that just stood the test of time. Did we then start accepting credit cards later? I think we did, but again, it wasn't my call. No one runs a cash register anymore, or hardly well, anyone. Well, anyway, I'm sorry, Tracy, <laughs> but I, I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. 
Because, you know, the only reason you take cash is to not declare it. Not really. declare it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you can't not declare it when in medical practice because all patients put on Medilink. And so, so you have to declare it. Uh, you can't not declare cash in a medical practice who is paying you for a consultation. Okay, so... Uh, so that's the cash thing. Okay? All right. So I know the optics don't look good, but I don't know why we didn't accept credit cards. Okay. The next thing is the whole upfront money for surgery. And again, I'll take some responsibility f for this, but you know, I, 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 this is what I normally say to patients. And I know I've been told that I can't do it anymore, but this is what I used to do. They would say to me, how much is it gonna cost? And I'd say, listen, I don't like talking about the money side of things. I don't like it influencing decision making. Please don't uh, think that I'm not gonna do the operation just because you can't pay me. In terms of upfront payment, I hate that as well. I mean, you don't think it's bad enough being diagnosed with brain cancer that you then got to think about money? It turns out that in my practice, our bad debt rate was 30%. So it's almost one in three patients weren't paying their bills after the surgery. And you can't run a practice like that. So then when my accountant says to me, you should start charging upfront, other doctors do it, I go, I really don't want to do it. So in terms of upfront payment, I agree. I don't like it, as if they don't have enough to worry about before it but our practice did do it because of the bad debt rate. Okay, in terms of getting the money the day before surgery, that's not us. That's the hospital. The hospital will not let them be admitted, will not let them into the operating room unless the money's paid up front. And that's the hospital. And again, I respect them. It's a business. It's a privately owned company. Uh, they've, got, uh, they've got to make their money. And that was their determination that the money had to be in the account before the patient could get admitted. That wasn't us. Next, the $2 billion institute to be built in Charlie Teo's name here in Australia. You can't operate in Australia now. Um, you're under investigation by the Healthcare Complaints Commission and that hearing has been postponed, but it'll happen. Yes. How do you see that playing out? How do you see the future for you? Oh, Tracy. Look. I'll just say this again, neurosurgery is very difficult, period. Neurosurgery on cases that other people have deemed inoperable is even more difficult because you've got people saying to you, you shouldn't do it. So that puts added stress on you. I want to operate in a place where I'm respected, where uh, I can teach, uh, others can learn from me, uh, where I don't have that added stress and I can concentrate on the patient and the disease and I don't have to concentrate on the politics of medicine. That's the place I want to operate in. So you might go overseas? I'm not going to say. Uh, I don't know if I can say this or not, and I don't know if we want to include it, but you know, I do have a project going on at the moment where, uh, at Blacktown where they may be building an institute uh, in my name uh, that will be a centre of excellence for neurosurgery and neurosciences. If that happens, and I hope it will happen in the near future, then that's the sort of environment in which I'd like to operate. Yeah. Mm. Are you funding that? Is the, how, is, how is that? Yeah, Lang Walker's funding it. Yeah. He hasn't made a public... The reason I don't know whether I should mention it, he hasn't made a public announcement yet. Yeah. I think you just did. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think he did, did too. Uh, Dr Teo says by the time that centre is potentially built, he'll be able to operate there even under his current restrictions. Now that full unedited interview will be on our website shortly. See you tomorrow. Good night.